All right, there we go. Good evening. I'm Reverend Steve Clegg. I'm the interim pastor at Second Baptist Church in St. Paul's. And this is our midweek Bible study, so we're going to get right into it. Um, we are in the book of Job, if you want to be getting your Bibles and turning into there. Um, but first, we'll do the announcements. Um, Sunday morning, like I said, we're doing our Sunday school at 9 a.m. Um, faithful workers class out in the sanctuary, everybody else in their classrooms. Um, then at 10 a.m., we're transmitting um, on the radio. Um, for those that feel more comfortable remaining in the parking lot, either because they've recently been you know, exposed or you know they have conditions or don't want to take any chances, but we still offer that opportunity um, just because there's a lot of things going around. So like I said, we offer that at the same time. Um, then also we put the sermon portion out over Facebook. So some opportunities to get with us if you're not you know in there physically with us in the sanctuary. But we have make other opportunities available. Um, we do ask that when you come into the church that you wear a mask. Um, you wear it until you get to your seat. If you're fully vaccinated, you're welcome to take your mask off. If you're not fully vaccinated, then we ask that you keep your mask on. And then also, um, we ask that you refrain from hugging and handshaking and all in physical contact. Because like I said, we do not want to transmit and... Like I say, we do have COVID. Um, it is in the rise in certain areas, um, in certain groups. Also, there is another virus that is going around, a very um, tough stomach bug, and another bug um, that will give you body aches and fever. So just trying to keep everybody safe until we get through this season, and then we'll hopefully be able to get back to more normal. Um, month of May, we're collecting small toys and games for the Christmas shoe boxes. Remember, no liquids. So don't buy any games or what is it? Um, different toys that have different fluids or liquids or gels them. Make sure none of that's any of this because um, they will remove them um, in the boxes in the hallway. Um, Mother's Day offering is this month and our goal is $1,500. Um, the envelopes and, and all are up on the table um, so you can pick them up. Also, um, remember the due date is 29th and our goal is 1500 also remember the food pantry sponsored by the Methodist Church. Um, that box is also in the hallway. Birthdays and anniversaries, May 18th. Mm, excuse me. May 18th is Shirley Warren, um, and then May 21st, Joey Kane. So we wish them happy birthdays um, as we go through that. Um, on our prayer list, um, in the bulletin, you got Marianne Edwards, Ronnie Locklear, Donna and Jordan Floyd, Louise McLean. Mike and Teresa Ivey, Charlene Hammonds, Danielle Smith, Kenny Jackson, Pearl Jackson, Angie Baxley, Gina White, Carol Powers, Tom Marie Taylor, Jada Clayton, Ashley Baxley, Kim Hewitt, Richard Holbrook, Karen Clay. Karen goes back to a couple appointments later in this week. We're hoping that we'll be done with IVs this week. Um, we'll see. Um, David Warren, Matthew Ward, Kathy Beanie, and Kathy was having a little bit better. She's obviously a long way to go, but it was showing some improvement. Um, Michael Davis, Beth Ward, Mac McMorrow, Joe Pate, Vanguard and Gaines, Diane Townsend, remember Miss Diane, um, Eugene and Florian Eford, Shannon Brick, Chloe Akers, Jr. and Janet House, um, remember both of those have cancer, Tamara Overby, Billy McKenzie, Dan Beard, um, Mary Beard, Mary said her eyes are doing a little better, but she has a long, um, three months, that she, you know, she's got a lot going on over the next three months in dealing with that eye. Um, so like I say, we need to be in prayer for her, Amanda Kane, Linda and Cornelius Hunt, the first family, Daryl Britt, Nash White, Lisa Ray Rodriguez, Bobby Pate, Patsy Butler, Wanda Carter, Kyle Edwards, the Supreme Court, um, Ronnie King, um, William Scott or Buddy Scott, some known, Deborah Holbrook, Dan Hurley, Taylor Fields, Ashley Blanks, Freddie McBroom, Lee Stevens, Jimmy Britt, Cynthia McMorrow, Wayne McLean. The pulpit committee, our church, the laws, our nation, its leaders, troops, and their families, and then the police officers, and then the pastors, and their families. Um, and then also, remember the Howe family in prayer. Um, Connie was telling us about that family. They've lost um, some adopted sons there. Um, Nevada Jones um, has having surgery this past Monday. I haven't heard any update on that, but pray that she's doing well. Um, she's 90 years old. Um, praise like I said with Kathy was doing making some progress um, Tracy Thomas many of you know her she was diagnosed with um, cancer um, and then Jennifer um, had a cousin that passed 
Um, then also, um, adding this today, it's been in now the news, all this going on up in Fayetteville. Um, the gentleman that came home found um, a gentleman dead in the house and someone in the backyard. Um, the gentleman in the house was the son of one of our supervisors over at the plant, um, Marcellus Brady. Um, so remember that family and also Nakia Brooks uh, was the other person um, that they found at the site. So like I say, be in prayer for those families as well. Um, what else can we say? I mean, we got a war going on in Ukraine. Um, depending on who you listen to, how well it's going. A lot of world issues right now. And um, like I say, um, very for our schools. Um, like I said, we got some graduations starting. We had some start last week with colleges and um, some of the early college graduation is this week and other graduations coming up over the next several weeks. Um, so we got all that going on. Um, then also you got a lot of school testing going on and it's not like the testing we used to take when we were younger. Um, these are, you know, some of these testing can hold a student back. They cannot pass, even though they may have done good all year. There's technically, they can hold them back. Um, so like I said, there's a lot of pressure put on these kids to perform and with all the COVID and all that's going on, it's been a tough year. Um, for these kids and so we need to be praying for the students and the teachers and administrators um, we need constantly be praying over our schools and our children um, like I said there's just a lot going on in those areas so be a member of those obviously be a member of our soldiers um, we have some deployed in various places um, we got a lot going on with our different soldiers um, hoping that nothing escalates that draws them into any kind of conflict um, but like I say there's a lot of hot spots around the world and we're praying for their safety and there's the safety of all soldiers I mean the soldiers follow their orders and it's a tough on the families obviously Ukraine just massive destruction um, even if the war ended today it'd be years who knows how many years before they could put all the infrastructure back and all the different things and the millions of people been displaced it's just a massive devastation. I mean, I compare it to some of the pictures looking like some of the pictures that we saw in Berlin after they bombed Berlin in World War II. So, there's horrible sights in a lot of places. A lot of unknown dead that still haven't been found. That's the really ugly part about this. There's a lot of people have been killed. They still haven't found the bodies of. Um, so, that's still going on. Um, so, like I say, be in prayer for our country. Um, a, lot, a lot of things going on in our country. A lot of gun violence, mass shootings. Like I say, I don't know how you contend with them. Um, but like I say, we just got a lot of mass shootings going on recently this past week. People think guns and violence is the answer. And it's not. And we just need to be in prayer for them. Um, so with that, I know there's a lot of private and personal concerns. Obviously, we're lifting those up as well as God knows them. So, um, with that, let's go to prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. And Father, we just thank you for your many blessings. And Father, there's just so much going on. You know, when, you, when somebody you know loses a son to gun violence, it's, it's horrifying. You know, and, you know, there's, we see so much in the news about gun violence, but it hits home and and you know, when someone you know experiences that and it's not the first time we've seen it in our area and it continues and father we just pray that people will quit thinking that violence is the answer father we need peace we need peaceful thoughts peaceful resolutions to come out of conflicts and not violence and anger and father we pray for those on our prayer list father we have a great many on our prayer list and like I say we have several names on the prayer list that have lost loved ones recently and father we just pray for them as they go through the grieving process father use us to minister to them and father use us to help them I, we don't understand how they feel we've all grieved but each person's grief is individual each person's relationship to the person that they lost is individual there is no I know what you're going through right now. No, we don't. We only can understand that there's a loss and we can understand maybe a relationship, but 
we don't understand how they feel because we didn't have that relationship with that person. But Father, let us offer comfort, let us offer prayers to those individuals. And Father, we pray for those in our church that are in shut-ins. Those that can't be with us in service anymore, that are physically in it, unable to be with us in service. And Father, we just pray that you'll bless them. May they be comforted by knowing that you're there with them, that they're never alone. And Father, may we continue to pray for them and lift them up. And Father, we would just hope that they could get strong enough to be back with us again. But Father, we pray that your will be done and you know what needs to be happening. Father, it's not always easy to know that they can't be back in service with it. It's hard. But we also understand the things that everything has a reason. Bless and keep them, Lord. And Father, be with their caregivers. And Father, we pray for the many on our prayer list. Several will have cancer. And some are recovering from, some are just get waiting diagnoses, and some are just have gotten diagnosis. And Father, it's not an easy disease, no matter how, how you have it. Father, bless them and keep them. Father, we pray that the cancer be healed. We pray that they get stronger, Lord, and that they can turn back, do them back to things they did before. That, Father, you can use them to bring glory to your name, that they can give testimony and witness to the great thing that you've done and bringing them a healing, Father. Father, glorify yourself in them. And, Father, we have many others that are going through tests and procedures and waiting tests and have upcoming procedures. Father, bless each and every one of them. God them and direct them, Lord. And Father, for those who have recently had surgeries and procedures, we just pray for good results and outcomes. They heal and mend and regain their strength, Lord. Bless them. And Father, we pray for our country. We pray for our country to be united. We pray for unity among the people. Let us not find reasons to separate ourselves, but let us find reasons to join together. Let us find unity and peace. Let us talk to one another as people, not as objects or whatever you want to call it, stereotypes. Father, let us see each other in Jesus' eyes so that we can talk and help one another. And Father, may our church be welcoming and warm and friendly. And when people come in, they want to come back. And that we honestly want them to grow in your name and to become closer to you. That that is our goal. That we help people find you and to help them to grow closer to you. Let us be outreach ministers. Let us be outreach evangelists and disciples and into our own community, Lord. Use us to reach the lost. And may we always be warm and friendly and inviting for them to come and join us and worship you with us, Lord. For it's not about us, it's about you. And Father, we pray for our leaders. Bless our leaders, Lord. We don't understand all that they go through and all that they hear and all, but Lord, we just pray for, that you'll bless them with wisdom. Bless them with understanding and bless them, Lord, that they'll do the job they're called to do and not to serve private and small groups but to serve the people as you lead them Lord fill them with wisdom and understanding and Father we pray for all the churches we pray that they join together and work together for you Lord and bring you glory may we represent Jesus well in all that we do and all that we say so that others will find Jesus. Father, we pray that you bless our Bible study this evening, Lord, as we study your word, that we'll grow closer to you and have a greater understanding. Father, we want to grow closer to you. May we desire to always be in communication with you as and all within our heart, but also that we set aside time daily to speak to you and to listen to you more importantly that will grow closer to you in a greater relationship. Father, use us. Use us as ministers. Use us as servants. But in all that we do, we bring glory to you, Lord. It's not about us. 
Father, watch over our loved ones. Father, many have urgent and private prayer requests. Lord, bless them. You know the prayers. You know the needs. And Father, we just pray to bless them. Strengthen them, Lord. That they can be for your service. And Father, just use us. It's hard sometimes. The world pushes us down. But Father, let us be victors and overcomers of the world. Father, we have many prayers and many requests. And I just hit the tip the iceberg. Father, we pray for our firefighters, our police officers, and the first responders, and all the caregivers. Father, we pray for our military overseas. And Father, there's just so much we can just pray for. But Father, we give you the praise. We give you the praise, Father, for you've blessed us. You've carried us. You've taken care of us. You've provided for us. And you've loved us. And Father, you've provided us a way to have eternal life through Jesus Christ, your Son. Father, we give you the glory. God, and direct us in all things. And may we learn and grow closer to you as we study your word. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, like I said, we're in Joel chapter 4. I'm drying out. It's like I walked outside today and they mowed the grass at the plant. For some reason, all of a sudden, I could feel it. Um, so, a little bit congested, a little bit blocked up, a little bit. Um, so, like I say, um, we're moving through Joel. We're all the way over into chapter 3. We're going to pick up at verse 17. Um, there's a Jewish proverb that says, No misfortune avoids a Jew. And, you know, you think about it, no people have suffered more at the hands of their fellow men than maybe the Jews have. I mean, you look at it, um, Pharaoh tried to drown the Jews, um, but instead, um, you have to think about that. Remember, he was drowning the, the male children in the Nile, and instead what happened to Pharaoh's army? They drowned <laughs> crossing the Red Sea as they tried to follow um, the Jews across the Red Sea. Balaam tried to curse the Jews, but God turned the curse into a blessing. The Assyrians and Babylonians captured the Jews to put them into, and put them in exile. But both those kingdoms do not exist anymore. Think about that. The Jews are still with us, but those kingdoms are gone. Haman tried to exterminate all the Jews. Um, if you remember that over in the book of Esther. But instead of exterminating Jews, what happened to Haman? Him and his sons were hanged on the very gallows that he had prepared for a Jew. Um, Nebuchadnezzar um, put three Jews in a fiery furnace. Only he discovered that four were walking around. And they did, were not burned by the fire. God delivered them. So, I mean, time and time again, you know, the, think about the Holocaust and the, Israel being gone away and the Holocaust and then you know the reinstatement of the Israel nation and you know the constant persecution you know the the Muslims don't even recognize the Jews most of them they don't even have Israel on their maps so like I say so many people are against them there is a um, Dr. Jacob um, Gartenhaus um, he's a missionary to his own Jewish people is think about that. What he is is a Christian Jew who now he considers himself a missionary to the Jewish people. And he used to have this saying, he says, We Jews are waterproof and fireproof. God has blessed us so that nobody can successfully curse us. And we shall be here long after our enemies have perished. God knows the, what the nations have done to the Jews. Think about it. They're going to be here. And everything we've been studying in Joel and Isaiah and all, the Jews are going to be here to the very end. Can't say that about any other nation. We don't read in Scripture that any other nation is going to be there. We take guesses and say, well, this one or that one, but we don't know. You know, we think about, you know, Russia, you know, be a country that you would expect to be there to the very end, but, you know, what is happening with the Ukrainian war and all is doing devastation to their whole 
economic system and all that's going on and they're talking about all kinds of ramifications for s decades to come I mean just will they recover or will they break up and further into pieces I mean there's just all kinds of things going on we don't know but we know that the Jews will be there to the very end and at the end God is going to settle the accounts remember it's not for us to extract vengeance vengeance is mine saith the Lord and he's going to have an settling of the accounts. But on the flip side of this, meanwhile, we as Christians need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem that they shall prosper. In Psalms 122, 6, it says, Pray for peace of Jerusalem, they shall prosper that love thee. We are to be praying for the, the Jewish people. Now, I had heard this many times growing up, that we should pray for the Jewish people, for Israel. Um, is typically what you'll hear people say, pray for Israel, but pray for the Jewish people. And all because what we need to do, not only pray for them, but have given opportunity, we should witness to them. Um, that, you know, Jesus is indeed the Messiah and the Lord. And I can remember growing up in my home church, and I remember it was just a special service. I want to say I was probably early teens. Um, but um, we had a special service one Sunday evening, and this group came in dressed in all this, you know, what do you want to call it, traditional or, you know, festive um, Jewish um, costumes or, you know, outfits that they use for celebrations, uh, I guess is a better word for it. And they were called, you know, Jews for Jesus, I believe, if I remember right, the name was Jews for Jesus. And they sung a lot of songs and all, and did a lot of different things to introduce us to the Jewish um, people, um, because their customs are different than ours, their food, so they're telling different things about, you know, Jewish customs and Jewish foods and different things, and just all kinds of different things, right? The Jewish faith, um, because they all were Jewish, Jewish uh, faith, and had converted to Christianity. So it was a great time of learning, but their whole purpose, you know, was coming was to continue and find support for their mission to evangelize Jews. And all they did they wanted to see Jews evangelized for Jesus. And of course in this, and we've seen it recently in several of our Bible studies, the things that are shown to us in scriptures that talk about Jesus in the Old Testament that you can use to witness to people who don't accept the New Testament, which is the Jews. And so like I said, it was interesting. But when I read this in Psalms 122 to 6, it says, you know, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I can't help but think about Genesis 12, 2 through 3. It's familiar to us. And, and I look at God's people, and, and now here's what it says. And I will make of thee a great nation. Of course, obviously God is talking to Abraham here, right? And I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now, I can remember that growing up, but, you know, we should be praying for the Jewish people. And you say, well, Abraham's dead. Yeah, but his descendants aren't. And remember, it's from the descendants of Abraham that Jesus came. How was there a blessing to the world? Jesus came from the Jewish people. That was his nationality. And that was the blessing to all the world because he didn't come just for the Jews, but he came for the entire world. That the entire world might be saved. Now, I say might because there are those that will reject him. As a matter of fact, a great many will reject him. But it's not because it's not there. The offer is there to be saved. They just have to accept it. So this is sort of our introduction going into this because what we're going to talk about this evening is some blessings. And so let's get into Joel chapter 3, 17 through 21. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her any more. And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountain shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters. 
and a fountain shall come forth out of the house of the Lord, and shall water the valley of Shittim. Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness, for the violence against the children of Judah, because they had shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall dwell forever, and Jerusalem from generation to generation, for I will cleanse their blood, and I have not that I have not cleaned, for lo, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. There's a lot in this, and we're really just going to focus on these verses this evening, as I've read some others, and we'll have some other verses. But in this set, we've been talking about war. Remember, it was symbolized by the locusts and all that were coming. And then we had the Assyrians coming in, you know, finally the overthrow of Jerusalem. But now we're coming back. And now after Israel going through all this, we're going to start seeing that God is going to pour blessings upon Israel, upon the Jewish people. Everything will change. And what's going to bring about this change is the king. So we are in the future. The king comes back and begins his reign. Who is the king? Obviously Jesus Christ. Joel promises a holy city, a restored land, a cleansed people, and a glorious king. That only can be end time prophecy. That can only be when Jesus establishes his kingdom. So let's start at verse 17. A holy city. When Solomon dedicated the temple, the glory of the God came down and filled the building. We remember that in scripture, right? Mount Zion, Jerusalem was built and its temple stood was the very place to Jews because it was the place God chose for this, right? That he chose this place. This is where the temple will be. And when the Babylonians destroyed the temple, the Jews prayed for a time when their temple would be restored and God's glory returned. It says, for God will save Zion and will build the cities of Judah, that they may dwell there and have it in possession. It's in Psalm 69, 35. Today, the Jewish people have no temple on Mount Zion. Instead, a mosque stands there, and we all know about that. But God promises him he will restore Zion and dwell there in all his glory. For the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places and will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein. Thanksgiving in the voice of melody. Isaiah 51 and 3. The prophets anticipate what a great day when sorrow of mourning shall flee away. And why? Because God will once again dwell with his people. There are several references to all of that. Jerusalem is called the Holy City at least eight times in Scripture, and we'll still see it called the Holy City today. Like every other city in the world, Jerusalem is inhabited by sinners. So how can it be holy, right? Sinners do sinful things. Well, that's the opposite of holy, right? But the day will come when Jerusalem shall be cleansed. In Zechariah 13, 1, it talks about that. And then truly become a holy city dedicated to the Lord. And Isaiah talked about that over in chapter 4. So now God is going to restore the land as indicated in verses 18 and 19. That's the next section, right, of this group of scripture. Over the centuries, think about the land of Israel. We talked about several different things. We talked about the Babylonians, the Egyptians, and... Syrians and you know keep going there's just time after time the Holocaust and all the different things um, Israel the land of Israel has just been ravaged by just various conquerors the Romans came through the Greeks came through you know several different things came through that area and what happens now is that there's a coming a day when the land will be like the Garden of Eden imagine that a lot of times we get pictures of Israel, we think of very dry, desolate land, and there is that in there. But from everything I've been told, it, Israel is also has much more water than the countries around it. So there's a lot more green in Israel than in the surrounding countries. And um, now it says, what? It's going to be like the Garden of Eden. Her wasteland's like the Garden of the Lord. So in the first chapter of Joel's prophecy, the people were well because they had no food. But what will happen when God restores his people land? Look at what it says. It will not, it'll be a land of milk and honey. It will have plenty of wine, water as well. 
we sometimes we don't think of water as a blessing so much here in this part of the United States. We are so thankful for, we, I shouldn't say thankful, we take for granted water. It's not an issue here. Even with all the things that's gone on out, shamores and water contamination, we don't think about water in a sense of, boy, we really got work to get it. As I've talked about, you go out west and you get into Nevada and those you know, Colorado River and all the reservoirs are fed by, that water is gone or going, I should say. And if it drops much more, there will be millions of people who will be scrambling for what? Water. That which we think is so plentiful here will be not there. The water will be so low it will not even be able to flow into the areas. And on top of that, the water is also used to create electricity. So they'll lose a lot of electricity generation and have to supplement it with other things. Water is a great blessing, but we take it for granted. And I wish I could remember, I wrote it in one of the other Bible studies, but I forget what percent of the water of the world is actually drinkable. It's a small percent. And we take it for granted. When you think about a world that's covered in what, 70% water, and there's such a small percent that's even available for drink. And we waste it and take advantage of it. So like I say, what happens when God blesses people, you know, the land of milk and honey and plenty of wine and water. And, you know, the land of Israel is always dependent on the latter rains and the early rains. But God will give them fountains and a river to water the land. No more having to worry about where will the rains come. And Jerusalem is, you know, the only city um, out of antiquity that was built that wasn't built near a great river. Think about it. You look at Jerusalem. It's not there as a city of commerce because of a river. You know, you go and you look at the great cities of the world and there's like, there's a river there. It's for commerce. It's built up around this, right? Not not Jerusalem. Um, like I say, you can go look at, the, you know, Rome and Nineveh and Tyre and Babylon and you know you go throughout and you see rivers but here what's it says but in the kingdom going forward in the kingdom Jerusalem will have a river that proceeds from the temple of God so out of the temple of God that has been built a river will flow out of it is what it's saying water will flow from the temple On that day, living water will flow out of Jerusalem, half to the east to the Dead Sea, and half to the west, to, and half to the Western Sea, which would be the Mediterranean. So it's going to come out and split to the Dead and to the Mediterranean. Now think about this: two great thing changes. Both of those are salt water, salt waters, right? As the water comes out of the temple, that will be pure water, not salt water. And flows into Dead Sea, it will dilute the Dead Sea. As it goes into the Mediterranean, it'll be going back into the ocean, and you know, connect up. But the Dead Sea will change from being salt to having less of a percentage of salt because the water will be restored fresh. So it may not be a Dead Sea by the time it's done. Think about that. That's a living water. And you can study more of that in Ezekiel 47. In contrast to the land of Israel, the lands of their enemies, it gives us a couple of examples. Egypt and Edom will be desolate. And it says why they'll be desolate. As punishment for the way they treated the Jewish people. Judgment. You know, from God. Reaping what you sowed upon God's people, God is going to give it back to you. That is an interesting thing, and it's going to carry on. There's even more judgments that are in the scriptures. But he just gives us a snapshot. You know, Egypt, Edom, desolate places. And if you look at Egypt now compared to what they say it was like hundreds of thousands of years ago, it's much more arid than it was before. In a lot of ways from the way, I've been, the way it's been described to me. The next section, it talks about a cleansed people. Remember, we got a holy city, but the people are sinful. So you can't have sinful people in a holy city. It don't work. 
So how is God going to take care of the people? You know, you got a city and the land are restored, but what do you do with the sinful people? You know, God's not going to wipe them out. No, what happens? God's people must be cleansed before they enter into the promised kingdom. And he's going to cleanse them of their sins and forgive them and restore them. So it says, on that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. It's in Zechariah 13, 1. The prophet Ezekiel describes this cleansing. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all the countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and ye shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. That's in Ezekiel 36. God changes the people. He brings them a cleansing flow. He cleanses them their sins. Obviously, if they're returning to the land of Israel, they're obviously believing God's restored them. And he's restored the nation, he's restored the land. But he's going to restore the people. Now, a little bit of background behind this. In the Old Testament, the laws that the Jews could cleanse the law said they could cleanse that which was defiled by using water, fire, and blood. That was the three ways. The priests were to wash with water and sprinkle with blood when they installed an office. And healed lepers likewise wash with water and sprinkle with blood. The priests had to wash their hands and feet and keep ceremonially clean as they served in a tabernacle. So we see this washing, this washing, right, and the sprinkling of blood. If anything became defiled, it had to be purified with the water of sprinkling. Here you go. That's in Numbers 19. Zechariah Zachari used this Old Testament truth to teach about the permanent internal cleansing that would come when the people saw their Messiah and trusted him in Zechariah 12 and 10. And they would experience a new birth and become a new people for the Lord. Obviously, when the Jews find Jesus, they're not going to be the same old people anymore. Remember, you meet Jesus, it changes you. They're going to be changed. And they're going to be changed for the Lord. And also they would experience it. So we see this cleansing that God's going to bring upon the people. They're going to believe in him. They're going to believe in the statutes. And they're going to accept Jesus. And they're going to live for Jesus and live for him in this time, in this place, right? And then finally, the last few words, just, we're just, the last half of verse 21 says what? For the Lord dwelleth in Zion. God's not somewhere where they can't see. He's going to be in Zion, the hill, in Jerusalem. Now the prophet Ezekiel watched as the glory of God departed from the temple. That was about to be destroyed. You can go over and read about that in Ezekiel 8 and 4 and somewhere. Then he saw the glory that glory returned to the new temple in the restored nation all the way over into chapter 43 he saw a new Jerusalem that had been given a new name Jehovah Shammah the Lord is there obviously he was seeing what the future because the temple wasn't destroyed and then rebuilt that quickly within um, Ezekiel's time and so here the prophecy that began with tragedy in the early um, chapters of Joel, chapter 1, 2, and first four through, we've been talking about the invasion of locusts and the armies and, and all. Now, what do we see? We see it closes with a triumph. The King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Jesus said to his disciples, Surely I say to you that in the regeneration, that is the future kingdom, when the Son of Man sits on his throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging or ruling over the twelve tribes of Israel. That's in Matthew 19. May we never lose the wonder of his glorious kingdom. Like I say, this is struggling for a lot of people. 
A lot of churches don't preach about the kingdom of heaven in a sense of giving people a picture of it. And all we know it's there. We say, you know, the kingdom of God, we're, you know, we talk about it. But to understand it and fully get engulfed in it, we don't see a whole lot of that in the church anymore. And it says, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Meaning what? Jesus has came down, defeated the enemy, and taken over. And then Matthew 6.10 says, What? Thy kingdom come. And then Revelation 22.20, even so, come Lord Jesus. A lot of people, as we mentioned in Sunday service, they're not looking forward to Jesus coming. Oh, they say it. But they've gotten so comfortable with this world and their focus is not on laying up treasures in heaven, but laying up treasures here on earth. Because they see more comfort and more coming out of laying up their treasures here than there. So where do you lay your treasures up? For where you lay your treasures, that's where your heart is. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. Father, it's so great to see the blessings that you can just pour out. We know we see the punishments and the wars and the destruction that comes when we're disobedient, Lord. But Lord, it's so great to see you when you pour out your love, you pour out your blessings. And let them flow upon a nation, upon a people. Father, bless us and take care of us. Guide us and direct us with wisdom. Father, we seek wisdom. We ask you for wisdom. Teach us and use us, Lord. Fill us with your love. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. God bless and have a good night.